since suffering as well as joy comes with being human, I urge you to remember this. Violence is what happens when we don't know what else to do with our suffering. So, Parker, I just biked down the hill from my house here, and I've been reading uh, the current issue of The New Yorker has an article about two different subjects that both break my heart. One is elephants. They're being poached. Mm -hmm. Every 15 minutes, an elephant is poached. They're on course to be extinct in the wild in 15 years, and as large and therefore vulnerable animals on this planet, I think they're symbolic of our re kind of dysfunctional relationship with mm -hmm making money, that's where the poaching is right. inspired, and uh, nature. Mm -hmm. And then the other article was about um, the gross levels of incarceration of um, Americans and uh, who maybe haven't even committed a crime. Some, right. some of them are in on parking tickets that they right. couldn't pay. Right. So I get a little bit depressed and defeated when I read some of what's actually happening in this world. How do you get up in the morning and what do we do with all that? Well, it's not, all, let's start by saying it's not easy. And, yeah. and, it, and the question is important and thoughtful and powerful and asking it is very important because otherwise we sweep it under the rug. Right, I don't want to ignore it. Exactly. Yeah. And, and, and just get my nice house together and have a gated community. Precisely, and, precisely. You'll yeah. eventually pay a psychic price for that, I right. think. But so, in my own case, um, I've, I've worked for a number of years now. I'm an old community organizer from after graduate school. Instead of going into the academy, I went into community organizing around race, racial justice in Washington, D.C. So the heartbreak started pretty early for me. Yeah. And the realization that my academic training wasn't able to answer most of the important questions I was asking, which really began my spiritual journey. So a concept that I've been working with for maybe the last 20 years is what I call the tragic gap, that we're always standing and acting in the tragic gap. On one side of the tragic gap are those harsh realities around us. We see them, you just named a couple, there are many more. On the other side of the tragic gap is, is a world that we, we, we know could be possible not because we wish it were so or we dream it is so, but because we've seen it with our own eyes. I'll give you a quick example. We know that on one side of the tragic gap is greed. Mm. A lot of people saying, I'm going to get the biggest cut piece of the pie I can and let the devil take the hindmost in terms of other people. Right. But I lived for 11 years in a Quaker intentional community where everybody made the same amount of money. I had a PhD from Berkeley. I was the dean of studies at this adult study center slash commune, kibbutz, yeah. ashram. This was Pendle Hill. Pendle Hill yeah. near Philadelphia. And I made the same amount of money, $2,400 a year plus room and board, as the 18-year-old who came to cook in the kitchen or work in the garden. Mm. So I know that radical economic equality is possible among real people in real space and time. So the temptation when you're standing and acting in the tragic gap is to flip out on one side or the other rather than to hold the tension between the two. Mm. You flip out on the side of too much harsh reality, you get what I call corrosive cynicism. We all know what that looks like. Mm -hmm. I see how to game the system and I'll get the max right. out of it for myself. On or just other, depression and you give up. Yeah, you give up, yeah. right. You sink into despair. Yeah. Flip out on the other side of the gap and you get what I call irrelevant idealism, which frankly is the pathology that, that afflicts more of my kind of people. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and Bernie Sanders. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, or spirituality, you yeah. know, people, people on a spiritual path. Um, right. So what's interesting, corrosive cynicism and irrelevant idealism sound like radically different things, but they both function the same way to take us out of the action out of the tragic gap. They flip us out. So when I look at my heroes, Nelson Mandela, Rosa Parks, Dorothy Day, Václav Havel, on and on, and some that w whose names are not widely known, I'm looking at people who, who died without being able to say, 
I'm so glad I lived a life committed to love, truth, and justice because now everyone can check that off their to-do list for the rest of time. Nobody who's mm. lived a life devoted to high values has ever been able to say that. Right, not Buddha, not Jesus. N none of them, Gandhi, not a one of them. Martin Luther King Jr. N yeah. Not a one of them. So what has sustained them when walking, standing, acting in the tragic gap, whether it's around elephants or the incarceration of especially African-American males, yep. young males, for non-crimes, yep. essentially. What, 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 how do you stand in that tragic gap year after year after year when you don't have first quarter, second quarter, third quarter results to show for it? And at the end of your life, you know you're not going to be able to say, I, I, I fixed the problem. I think the answer is there has to be a standard that trumps effectiveness. Um, it's not that I'm against effectiveness, but I'm really clear that the tighter we cling to effectiveness, the smaller and smaller tasks we're going to take on right. because they're the only ones with which you can get results. Education is a good example. We're no right. longer interested in educating children. We're, We're interested in getting kids to pass tests, yeah. right? Yeah. So what's the standard that trumps effectiveness. So something more unconditional. Yep. Whether it's working or not. Yep. And service of some sort. In my mind, the name of the standard is faithfulness. Mm. Faithfulness to my gifts, faithfulness to my perception of needs in the world, and faithfulness to those moments when my gifts intersect those needs in a way that I can make me of some service. Mm -hmm. It may be a small thing, it may be a big thing, but if I can at the end of the road Say, yeah, you know, to the best of my ability, within my human limitations and finitude, I was faithful to all of that. I think I'll be okay. So when you're faced with the next generation, as you will be today in a very physical manifestation, you're giving the commencement address at Naropa University in just an hour or so. Um, what do you say to them? They're hopeful but they also know the difficult realities they're about to go into, that may be fearful of some of those. Mm -hmm. What do you say to give them? Well, the first thing that I want to communicate, to say here, and that I feel deeply, is I love this generation. I, yeah. I do a lot of work with them, I meet a lot of them, yeah. and they really do fill me with hope. So many of them have been engaged in these kinds of issues, and they've been engaged in a different way than my generation was. I spent the 60s in Berkeley, and I'm very acquainted with the syndrome. Uh, I was in grad school there, but I'm very acquainted with the syndrome that says, we're going to go out and save the world. We're going to Berkeley change. was the epitome, the focal point of activism. Y exactly. In the 60s. In, yeah. in the 60s, right. Yeah. I forget that there are some people who don't remember that yeah. as well as I do. I went to Boston University, and that was like called the Berkeley of the East. Yeah, of the East, right. Yeah. <laughs> so, so you know, there were so many people there saying, I'm going to change the world and it's only going to take five or ten years. And when they went five or ten years later, they had not much to show for it. Yeah. They all became investment bankers or hedge fund operators. You know, there, that cynicism right. set in that right. flipped them out right. in, into that harsh reality to make, the, make a living off it. Right. So, it, it, what I want to say to young people is standing and acting in the tragic gap is going to break your heart. Mm. It just is. But there are two ways for the heart to break. It, it can shatter into a million pieces and sometimes in the process of shattering get hurled like a fragment grenade at the ostensible source of your pain. And there's a lot of that going around. Or the heart can break open into greater capacity, mm. greater capacity to hold the world's pains as well as the world's joys. And, and if the, the key to it is, are you doing something every day to help make your heart supple enough to open rather than crack apart when that big heartbreak comes? And I see that in terms of, am I, am I taking in Am I taking in the pain of the moment? Am I doing what you were doing, riding your bike down right. here, thinking about those yeah. elephants or those incarcerated individuals? Um, that stretches the heart a little. That opens it a little. That, that, it, you're like a runner making a muscle more supple so it won't snap when it's put under pressure. And then when the big heartbreak comes, 
the heart breaks open. I, let me use a very homey example. I know lots and lots of people at my age, 76, who have now lost the dearest person in their lives to death. Um, they go underground into deep grieving. They think life will never be worth living again. But then slowly, slowly, they emerge to realize that, that not, not, in, not in spite of that loss, but because of that loss, they have become more compassionate, more open, more caring, more hospitable mm. to otherness and to other people's needs. Their heart has been broken open by this loss rather than destroyed. Mm. And most of those are people who were practicing some form of the supple heart for a long time it, without even knowing it one way or another. They were just trying to be decent human beings. Yeah, there's a, they talk about bamboo a lot in the mm. Buddhist tradition, so it, it has a capacity to bend. Mm -hmm. It's strong, but it bends. It yes. doesn't just shat, you know, shatter, like right, you were saying. Right, exactly. That's, yeah. that's what we can do with our hearts, bamboo hearts. So deep, lots of deep breaths. Yeah. So on a practical level, I guess, the final question, how do we do this? I mean, you're a Quaker. Is that what are what are some tools that maybe someone out there is it meditation is it being in nature? Mm -hmm. Yeah, for me it's it's all of the above. So I guess my practices are a sitting in silence, mm. b um, engaging in community, and that doesn't need to mean a big group of people. It can mean one or two trusted people mm. with whom I sort and sift what I'm hearing from within myself in the silence. I, as a Quaker, I deeply believe that we all have a voice of truth within ourselves, an inner teacher that's, that is the best teacher we've got, but we have other voices in there too, fear, greed, ego, etc. And we need community to help us sort and sift um, which voice we're hearing and what to do with what we hear. So those two practices are important to me. Nature is important to me. I think it's become even more so as I've grown older. And in my case, writing is a very important spiritual discipline. It's, it's the way I process a lot of my external world experience um, in, a, in a form of meditation. So writing for me is not about getting a really clear thought about what I want to say and then committing it to paper. It's about just starting to write and see, find out what's in there. Yeah. And, and, and then as I go to craft the language in a way that might build bridges instead of walls hmm. about what I'm trying to say. But it's, it's always a way of uncovering inner content. Um, I drive book publishers crazy. I have nine books out there now. And every time the, you know, the salespeople have said, OK, who's this book for? And I've always said, how the hell should I know? It's for whoever buys it, right? right. And, right. and the people who've bought my books have turned out to take me totally by surprise over the years. But I, I'll, Well, I, and they've sold very well, so. They've done OK. And, yeah. and I've, I've always said, I can't tell you who it's for. The, the world will figure that out. But I can tell you where it's from. Mm. And it's from the immediacy of my own experience as I live life on the Mobius Strip. Mm -hmm. and try to keep my heart open in a way that will make it more open rather than crack apart. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you. Parker Palmer, appreciate it. Thank you. Have fun today. Good to be. Oh, I'm already having fun with Good. you, Waylon. Yeah, so that was we're great. We're off to a good start. It was very helpful. That's what I was thinking about on the bike. I was like, we had tons of notes, and I was like, I just want to ask that question. What yeah. do we do when the yeah. whole world is... Yeah. Not the whole world, there's a lot of positive yeah. stuff, but yeah. the world is burning up on some yeah. level. Yeah. It's so sad. Yeah. It what is someone like you, it is sad. what's your attitude about that? Yeah. So. Well, when people say to me, you know, how can you have hope? I say, well, it keeps me employed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I need a job, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and it's true. I mean, yeah. what's the alternative? S sit in the corner and suck your thumb. But, but it's keeping both in mind, that tension yeah, is absolutely. not just being hopeful. It's holding the tension. No, yeah. there's a difference between hope and cheap optimism. That's what I meant by Bernie Sanders, who I actually yeah. like, is, yeah. you know, people, every election cycle you see yeah. it, whether you're on the right or the left, you hold up some ideal of your beliefs. Right. 
and then you know Obama won, had, had hope right. on the poster, and then he right. won, and you see what he had to deal with and yeah. how yeah. little or much he could get done. It's reality. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Very You're funny, a good man too. Funny, funny guy. The authority granted to me as provost, and with the support of the president and the faculty of Naropa University, I confer upon Parker J. Palmer the degree of Doctor of Contemplative Education, honoris causa. I did not, <clears throat> I did not expect this, and it kind of blows me away, but I just have to tell you my first response. I'm thinking back to the five long, hard years I spent at Berkeley in the 60s trying to get a PhD, finally getting one. I wish I had known at the time that you could get one in about 90 seconds. <laughs> So, let me just say, if any of you guys are planning to go to grad school for an advanced degree, scratch that plan, go get a job, wait about 50 years, and you get one of these. Okay? <laughs>